Hi, this is Randall Schwartz, host of Floss Weekly. This week, Aaron Newcomb joins me. We're going to be talking about getting more women and retaining more women in high school STEM programs and all the way into the workplace. You're not going to want to miss this, so stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Floss Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Floss Weekly with Randall Schwartz and Aaron Newcomb. Episode 409, recorded November 1st, 2016. Chick Tech. It's time for Floss Weekly, the show about free, libre, open source software. I am your host, Randall Schwartz. Merlin at Stonehenge.com bringing you each week the movers, the shakers, the big projects, little projects, projects you may be using every day and unaware of it, projects you may want to go download right after this show if it's about software. But today's show is not about software, but we'll get into that in just a minute. But let's go ahead and bring on my co-host for this week, Aaron Newcomb. Welcome back to the show. Hey, Randall. Thanks. Glad to be here. Cool. And where are you speaking to us from? Did I get that right? Did I get the right order? Yes, sir, we did. Okay. Uh, yeah, you did. Yeah, I'm here in the, the man cave, but you can't see the good stuff because it's all in front of me. And that's my wife's mess back there. So you get to okay. you get to look at that while we chat. Uh, what were you uh, dressed up as for Halloween, by the way, Randall? I was I dressed up for I was hiding in the basement of my brother's place, which I'm still in this week. I'm uh, in Lacey, Washington, just north of Olympia, Washington, staying with my brother and his, fa- his wife and, and son through the holidays and hanging out with mom as well. She's just nearby here. Um, and they are big Seahawks fans, as you can see over my left shoulder. If you look at the video that they're part of the number 12 of the Seahawks. So we watched a Seahawks game, I think, over the weekend as well. Ah. Uh, yeah, so you, didn't, so you didn't dress up. Come on. Uh, well, I, I dressed up as a programmer, but that kind of makes me look like this. So, yeah. Right. That's kind of well, the way have, it works. I had, I had, it's funny because I had one uh, young uh, lady come to the door, and uh, I said, oh, what are you dressed up as? And it was pretty obvious, but you know, she had thick glasses and all this stuff. She's like, oh, I'm dressed up as a nerd. And uh, <laughs> I said, oh. <laughs> you don't know said, nerds like we do. <laughs> exactly. Yes. She said, I'm a nerd. And I, and I said, oh, I'm a nerd too, but I'm not dressed up as a nerd. You want to see what I was dressed up as? You have a you have a picture? Yeah, sure. Oh, wow. That's a lot more work <laughs> than I would have put in. So can you guess who that is? Uh, Jimi Hendrix? No, but that's a I close guess. I only see a tiny bit. Oh, the painting guy! The painting guy! The, yeah, the guy. Uh, yeah. We'll just dab in the little trees here. Happy yeah, little trees. Happy little trees. I was Bob oh, Ross, and I had a can, had a candy palette. So the kids would come up, and I'd uh, they they could pick the candy off the palette, whatever kind of candy they wanted. So uh, oh, it was it was pretty funny. That's killer. <laughs> that is killer. All right. Was, wow. the, the weirdest thing was is that I had. Uh, um, I had people, the adults knew who I was and they thought it was funny and they were taking pictures and all this stuff, right? But then the for the kids, that look is kind of a creepy look. So yes, I had a yes. lot of kids coming up like, I don't know. <laughs> so that yeah, was pretty so funny at least, though. At least you weren't Captain Kangaroo like we saw on the run in here. So that would have yes. been even creepier, yes. I think. I or think Ronald so McDonald. At this point. Would- Ronald McDonald's also not very good. So there we go. Oh, okay. Hey, so we're chatting, but that isn't what this show is about. This show is actually about our, the projects that we're bringing each week to this show. Today, no exception. This week, we're going to be talking about Chick Tech. It's an organization designed to, well, let me read the their front page blurb here. It's a uh, nonprofit dedicated to retaining women in the technology workforce and increasing the number of women and girls pursuing technology-based careers, which is a very noble goal. We have a couple of people representing Chick Tech today. We're going to bring them on in just a couple of minutes. Uh, we've got uh, uh, Nicole Enghart. Hope I pronounced her name right. Actually, I should pronounce her name right since she was on a previous show uh, back uh, episode... Um, was it 306 back in July? She was with us talking about the COLA uh, library system. So she has come back to talk about Chick Tech. We also have uh, Janice Leving, uh, Levenhagen to Seeley. I should rehearse these before I actually start the show, shouldn't I? Okay, apparently they let anybody run this show. But we're going to be bringing them on in a couple minutes to talk about their organization. And also how it fits in with other similar gold organizations because gold, gold. Gold, not gold like the color. Gold like they have goals. All right, um, uh, and, and see how they fit in. And also, um, 
uh, talk, sort of back up a little bit and see what the problems actually are and how they intend to actually uh, help solve them. So um, I've been going over their website. They've got a, they're, they're still pretty fledgling from what I can see, but they've got a number of um, uh, city chapters and things like that. So we'll talk about all that instead of me making it up. Uh, Aaron, uh, any comments before we uh, bring on our guests? Uh, only that this is an exciting topic for me because, uh, as uh, some of you know, I run a makerspace locally, and one of our goals in the makerspace is actually to introduce more women to technology and get them involved. And we're doing pretty well. Uh, we've got about 25 percent uh, uh, four to one ratio right now, which is which is not bad. But we'd like to get that even higher. And so uh, for this topic for me is very, very interesting. And I'm uh, anxiously, anxiously awaiting to talk to our guests so I can learn about how we can uh, get more women into our group and get them more interested in what we're doing. That sounds awesome. So uh, I think it's just about time to go ahead and bring them on. So let's first welcome to the show, Nicole Anker. Welcome back to the show, I should say. Hi, thanks for having me back. And I'm um, really excited to get to talk to you all about what we're doing with Tic Tac. Yes, yes. And where are you speaking to us from? I think I have a guess. I am in Austin, Texas. Uh, in my office, I work from home um, doing a Tic Tac. And the job that pays me over at Red Hat, I'm a content strategist. Content strategy. It's always kind of useful. Let's also go ahead and bring on Janice. Janice Leving Hagen Seeley. I'll get it right eventually by the end of the show. Uh, uh, welcome, welcome to the show. Thank you. Yes, it's uh, Levin Hagen Seeley. So you were you were okay. close the first time. <laughs> okay, right. And getting further away as I keep repeating it, so I think I'll yeah. just stop there. So um, this is sort of for either of you because I, I don't know how you sort of divvy up your work with Chick Tech. But let's 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 start with just sort of the history of the organization itself, and then we'll talk more about the broad context in which it sort of fits into. So, uh, either of you, how, who's who's been with the organization the longest and wants to talk about the history? Yeah, so I'm the founder, so I will okay. start with that. <laughs> Yay! Uh, so I started Chick Tech um, early 2012. So we've been around for almost five years. We've been running programs for almost. Four, and um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, yeah. So we've been running programs for high school girls for almost four years. We've been running uh, events for career uh, women as well for almost four years. Um, we started here in Portland, and we are now in fourteen cities across the country. Uh, we're uh, planning on twenty-four by this time next year, so we're pretty excited about that. Oh, I got so completely caught up in trying to pronounce your last name, I forgot to ask you. So you're in Portland, Oregon? I am, yeah. Okay, all right. Hey, well, I'm waving to my home city here. There we go. All right. <laughs> just, technically, I am a Portlander, even though I'm currently up in uh, up in north of Olympia. Um, so so for four years, Chick Tech's been delivering programs, producing things. Um, what was the problem that you saw that actually, I mean, it takes a lot of work to start an organization and, and get it running and keep it running. What problems were you seeing that weren't being yet served by, because uh, I know there's a number of similar organizations. So what, what, did, what did you see that uniquely that said, I got to start an organization to make this work? Yeah, so, um, so for one, I think there was actually a crop of organizations that started right around in 2011, 2012. So in early 2012, um, we were, I wouldn't say one of the first, but we were, we were kind of on that rise. Uh, so I started Chick Tech basically to provide girls and women with the opportunities and support that I didn't have when I was in technology. So I um, basically fell into technology as a high schooler. So I, I chose computer engineering as my undergrad in um, about halfway through my senior year. And uh, I was, even though I was really good at math, no one had ever really encouraged me to try out a technology career. So I had never done Lego robotics. I hadn't done um, AP computer science. Uh, and so when I started our high school program, it was really focused on girls like me. So girls who have the aptitude to do well in technology, but who are not being encouraged to do it or who don't fit the stereotypes. So they think that they won't be successful. 
So to date, 64% of our attendees have never created a technology project before starting Chick Tech. Uh, so that's one of the biggest difference, differences between Chick Tech and the other girl in tech organizations is that we really focus on the unusual suspects. So that also includes, we have a, a strong focus on bringing in underrepresented minorities as well. We make sure that we lower as many barriers as possible. So we provide childcare stipends to teen parents. We provide transportation to any girl who needs it, uh, which is a pretty big pain uh, for our volunteers. Uh, we're almost completely volunteer run at this point. We have thousands of volunteers across the country and we only have uh, at this point two full-time staff. And uh, we also provide um, sign language interpreters as needed uh, so that that access is really important to us. So it's less about finding the girls who already think of themselves as technical and continuing to help them along that path, but really broadening the participation of girls in general so that more girls are on that path who then should be going into other programs who are looking to continue those girls' paths. Uh, so what I tell people is... Uh, uh, we're the gateway drug to technology for girls. So <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how anyone else feels about that, uh, uh, but I like it. <laughs> I like well, it. Um, yeah. it okay, you know, when, when, Janice, when I talked to Janice uh, at, a, at OzCon in Portland a little over a year ago, uh, oh no, I guess we're at two years ago now, um, I asked her if she had a chapter yet in Austin, and uh, they did not. And so her story is so similar to mine and to all the other people who volunteered for my leadership team that it just made sense, you know, to start this chapter here. And I, I would add that at least in Austin, we're the only group focusing on high school girls. There's a lot of groups focusing on girls in middle school and then of course adults, but um, no one seems to be focusing on the, the high school age. And while it is important to to get the girls interested in middle school, uh, too often we're sort of leaving them to their own devices in high school and they're losing interest or not being encouraged. And, you know, we're, we're missing out on an opportunity. So. Well, you know, I have to admit it's been, you know, 30 ish years since I've been in high school. So I'm, I don't know what's changed since I was there. And I also had an unusual school upbringing in that I was career oriented from the time I was nine years old um, what, what, if, if, if Chick Tech didn't exist, what are these women, what else are, what else are they considering that they're not sort of considering something that fits perhaps some of their inner passion and, uh, skill set? Uh, I, I, I'm just trying to see how we're getting a little derailed here. You know, what, what can any, can you, can you help explain that to me? I'm, I'm naive about this. So I think there's a, a, a misunderstanding amongst young folks on what a career in tech actually is. And um, unfortunately, the teachers aren't being provided with the best tools as of yet. And we don't have computer science in all the schools and, you know, the whole issue with the education department in general. But what's happening is, you know, the girls are looking and this is a generalization, of course, are looking for careers where they can make a difference. And they look at uh, the traditional computer engineer as someone who sits in front of their screen all day, writing code and, you know, not really making a difference. And they're not seeing that if they are a computer engineer sitting in front of their screen, they could be writing code that improves the lifestyle of people all over the world. And they don't realize that there's other ways that they can still work in technology as well and improve the lives of others. And so it's an education uh, gap where we're not explaining what a career in technology could actually achieve. Well, now I'm going to, I hate to break it to you, but 95% of the engineers I know do in fact sit in front of a screen, not really making a difference to anybody <laughs> except the, the shareholders <laughs> bottom line. So uh, yeah. maybe right. you're but misinformed. So you're more. misinformed. No, no, no. Um, no but uh, but that's so part of what more I, you can do. But that's part of what I enjoy about open source. And I think this is one of the reasons that I continue to have a passion for this show and for the projects I get to bring on this show is that there are places 
where being a programmer, being a software engineer, being a UI expert, being a, even somebody who can do translation or, or um, organize projects or, or help close bugs, things like that, that these are all very useful in at least open source projects where that sort of thing is actually happening. Um, but but I, I don't want to dispel the myth that most of us are just sit in front of glass TVs all day and uh, and we occasionally have like a Slack chat or IRC in the corner where we're and we go out to lunch with our coworkers. But that's about all the socialization we get. Uh, sorry for totally defeating the purpose of your organization, but maybe you, what you're talking about is that other yeah. five to ten percent of the jobs out there that actually are really cool, which I've had a number of over my years. So. Um, <laughs> You're, you're, you're coming at this from a negative standpoint. I feel like I'm making a difference. Um, I might be standing in front of you, know, sitting in front of a screen all day, but I'm making a difference. I, I refuse to accept your definition. <laughs> Well, okay, so so let's talk about some of the specific programs that you do in spite of the fact that I have no otherwise. <laughs> I, I'm going to take I'm going to regret this whole show. I could already tell at the end of the show. But no, I'm, I'm just making a joke, by the way, guys. I'm no. making a joke. Please, yeah. please do not take it. The same. So let's talk about some of the programs. Yeah, um, so well, I can talk ahead, about a yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I'll talk in general, and then uh, maybe Nicole can talk a little bit about what her, her chapter specifically is working on. Uh, so we run um, K through 12 programs, uh, specifically focused on... Um, uh, as I mentioned before, those girls who are not yet opting in, uh, particularly one of our signature programs is Chick Tech High School. So it's a year long program for 100 high school girls in each city. And we bring them in for a two day kickoff event uh, in November or uh, this year. It's also very early December. And uh, they go through one of seven workshops. It's either hardware or software or green energy has snuck in there sometimes as well. And then they go through monthly workshops for the rest of the school year. And if they allow us to, we connect them with a man or woman in the technology industry as a as an industry mentor so that they can continue learning and continue to um, become more of a part of the, uh, the community. And our goal is really, uh, so what I tell people is that I don't really care what they're learning. I care how they feel when they're learning it. Because the goal is to, again, get them excited about technology, increase their confidence, increase their interest, and uh, really help them feel like they have that community so that they won't be isolated and they won't be alone. Uh, because we don't, as people, realize how important that sense of belonging is until we don't have it. Um, and that's where I believe a lot of bullying comes from. Um, we have people who are literally willing to kill others to get that sense of belonging. If we look at if we look at inner city gangs, and we would like to be uh, one of those places where you can join without killing anybody, because we feel <laughs> that that's better. Uh, but really, you know, we don't we don't see how important that is. And for me, you know, I started Chick Tech because I didn't have that community. I didn't have that support as an undergrad student. And I ended up leaving technology. And I remember the isolation. And I remember feeling like I wasn't good enough. And uh, I had imposter syndrome. And having that support network and that community who could have reminded me that I was awesome probably would have helped me to stay in technology. And so um, that's what we give the girls who are in our program, we show a very strong increase in their confidence. So they feel like they can be successful in terms of technical skills. And then we also give them that community so that they feel like they can be a part of something and be accepted. And then in our career level programs, we do uh, we have similar goals. So we look at um, when we look at our meetup groups and we look at our conference. So we have a conference we're running in seven different cities. Uh, it's called ACTW, Advancing the Careers of Technical Women. And again, it's all about creating that sense of community, that sense of belonging, providing them with the opportunities that they need to be successful, that they're often not getting um, in the uh, uh, in their workforce. Uh, or in the in their workplace. And so providing them with that, we're 
um, we're providing them with um, a reason to stay in technology. And often the people who go to our career level programs are also our volunteers. So not only are they able to change their careers, but they're able to give back and feel like they're uh, they're able to make a difference. So even if it's really frustrating in their workplace, um, they're changing that and they're helping the next generation so that it's going to be less frustrating for everyone. I don't have a lot to add to what Janice just said. <laughs> so um, um, Janice is awesome. You know, she she gave me that that whole spiel. You know, when I was thinking about starting the chapter, and the the belonging was a big deal uh, for me too. And I think that's where open source for me has made such a, a difference um, because I am part of a community instead of just part of a you know another cog in a, a big company. And so that's my my personal. Thing. And then I do try to bring that open source education to our girls. And so uh, since this is our first year in Austin, we're only doing the, um, in 2016, we're only doing the high school program. Um, and we are offering workshops on digital filmmaking, robotics, web design, game development, um, and more. And so these girls are going to come in and get to do these hands-on projects. And when they're done, they're going to have something they created to take with them. Um, and we have an amazing set of volunteers that are going to be teaching these girls and then mentoring these girls throughout the rest of the year. And then one of those cities that Janice mentioned for ACTW will be Austin uh, in 2017. And so we're sort of we're rolling out each program in a, you know, a separate year so that we don't overwhelm ourselves and uh, find that we don't have enough people to help out. But it's going to be really awesome. And our kickoff is November 12th and 13th. So Right now, I eat, sleep, drink, chit tech. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so let me jump in here because I've got a bunch of questions, but I, I want to get to some of the questions that are coming up in chat first. So the Andromedan asks, and this is something that you were just touching on a little bit, uh, but maybe a little bit more specific in terms of where do you see teachers and communities failing when it comes to encouraging girls and women to follow their passions? So what are the things that people are doing wrong here? So I would say that part of it is um, just a, you know, I, I know uh, Nicole was talking about the stereotype, which is a huge thing. And I also think that we um, we just need to help broaden the uh, what these girls and boys are um, exposed to. So often, you know, they'll they'll only have information from the media, right? So the really stereotypical computer science um, computer science careers where they're like hacking into government systems or whatever it might be, right? And they they live in the basement. They're not just visiting someone's el someone else's basement, um, and that's a really important thing. So being, um, what we forget is, you know, as we get older, we have so many different life experiences and that helps us to understand all of the career options that are out there. And when they're in school, they're really often only seeing what their parents do and maybe what some of their parents' friends do. And they see their teachers, they see their doctors and their nurses, and that's, it, you know, other than specialized programs like Chick Tech. And there are other programs that are out there. There are, you know, Lego robotics and computer science. But when you're a when you're a teenager, you just don't notice these things as much, right? Because if unless someone's really pointing them out to you. And uh so you have that lack of exposure and then you have that um you also have the the stereotypes that the teachers hold, right? So teachers most of the time have never been a computer scientist. So they often don't know what a computer scientist or a computer engineer or an electrical engineer does either. And so they have that lack of knowledge. They And as we all know, we all have unconscious bias. So we all automatically assume that the boys are going to be better at math and science than girls are. And so they're unconsciously using that bias to change the uh, the paths of these girls and boys, right? And so they're not encouraging the boys to be nurses. They're not encouraging the girls to be um, mathematicians or, or technologists either. 
Uh, and so they actually showed, they, they, there was a study that came out not that long ago that was about the, the biases of elementary school teachers. And they looked at how, um, how that changed girls' interest in math. And they actually showed, and I don't remember exactly the, the entire thing, but basically they measured the girls' interest and aptitude and what their, what their math scores were at the, in elementary school. And then they measured the bias of their teachers. And then I think it was in sixth grade, they looked at the girls' grades in math. And they had actually, the more biased their teacher was, the lower their grades were. And um, I can find that study so you can read the actual facts. But that was the basic, uh, the basic gist is that we all have unconscious bias. And most of us are, I, was, I like to think that most of us in technology are becoming really um, aware of that and how that's affecting our environments and how that's affecting how we treat others around us. Um, but for people in these schools, they don't have unconscious bias training and they don't have a big push in their companies to remove that bias in their processes. And so they're just going along and doing the best that they can. Um, and that unfortunately often I believe includes, um, having those biases and not, not knowing it. Interesting. Um, there's a qu couple questions that relate to each other and I want to get to these as well. Uh, one is from gray 580, um, who is asking about how, what, good ways to introduce elementary. I know we talked about high school a lot um, because you do high school programs, but what about elementary age girls? And is there a way to introduce them to tech? Um, uh, he asked, what's an effective starting point? And then Virgil, I think, also asked about um, would starting young with things like Minecraft help to start young ladies in tech fields with coding. So I guess those two are related uh, as they both uh, pertain to introducing girls to tech and what do you do um, at an early age, what's the, what's effective? Could you, could do you, do you do any elementary school age programs as well as the high school? So, so some of our chapters are doing the, the like Jenna said, K through, through 12 and they're doing some camps for the younger kids with, with Chick Tech. Um, to, to answer the question of how do we get the younger kids interested, um, it's it's the same as almost anything and making it fun. And Minecraft is definitely going to, to be a good way to do that. Um, you know, I I watch my nieces and nephew play with Minecraft all the time and, and get to build things. And then, you know, transitioning that into, you know, programming for Minecraft is great. I volunteered for a, a hack fest for the Girl Scouts of Central Texas. And I got to work with the little girls and they played with Scratch, which if you haven't heard of it, awesome tools for you to, yep. to introduce your younger kids to. And um, I was supposed to teach them how to create their own little bio movie thing. And I said, you know what? I'm not going to stifle their creativity. And so I showed them how to go through the tutorial. We did that together. And then I said, have fun. These girls created such amazing little programs and videos and you just using their creativity. And so I would say, you know, introducing them to tools like Scratch and the other uh, programming games out there. There's robotics uh, kits that you can buy. There's all kinds of online programming as well. And letting them be creative. Don't make them have to stick to the curriculum because that creativity is what all kids want. You know, hey, look what I created. You know, Legos. You could get the Lego Mindstorm robot. Um, this is, these are great ways to instill the uh, principles of technology into these kids young and get them interested in it with fun, uh, fun tools. And then, you know, hopefully they, they follow that path in school. So, Nicole, I want to stick with you for just a second because I wanted to ask um, as well, you mentioned open source and using open source uh, ideology, if you will, um, when you run these programs. What, I mean, this is an open source show. So what does mm -hmm. this program have to do with open source software? Well, um, number one, uh, most open source software or open source hardware even is going to be more affordable for our, our little budgets. Um, <laughs> purchase. And so, for example, in our program in Austin, we're going to be doing a workshop on building your own computer using a Raspberry Pi. So, you know, we're using um, open source languages. We're using open source hardware. Um, we have set up a GitHub account for uh, our chapter so that the girls can contribute all or share all their code from their web development and their game development workshops as well. Um, 
And then going forward in our monthly workshops for the girls, we have workshops on how to set up Linux, how to uh, use GitHub, how to set up GitHub, um, and then other related uh, t topics. And so basically, we're showing them open source tools without even necessarily saying, hey, look, this is an open source tool. We're, we're making it the norm. This is what we're using. Um, and so hopefully that you know sticks with them again as they go through. Um, I'd love to give them a little workshop on open source myself, um, but being the chapter leader, it's, it's often hard to be an instructor as well. <laughs> so we'll see down the road how I can incorporate that. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Hey, Janice, I'm wondering what resources do you provide for your chapters? Um, and how do you actually pay for all this activity? Because I know running a volunteer nonprofit organization myself, it's always a challenge. We got a lot of people coming in saying, oh, we'd love you to do this program. We'd love you to do this program. Uh, but it's not like we have a lot of funding to pay for that because you have to hire people and all that. So how do you deal with those resource issues and what resources, if somebody wanted to start a chapter, for example, what resources would they expect to get? Yeah, definitely. So we, um, as I mentioned earlier, we have, uh, we're very volunteer focused and uh, we have two full-time people. We're, we're expanding that to three full-time people, uh, which will be amazing. Um, but uh, the big way, so a lot of what we do is, um, well, so the chapters raise their own funding in general. So we, uh, when we can, we provide a seed fund for new chapters. So at this point, the seed fund is $4,000. Um, it costs about fifteen dollars to $20,000 to run a chapter. And so we provide resources for the chapters and, and support for the chapters to go and talk to their local, uh, their local tech companies and um, help them to get corporate funding. Corporate funding is where most of our, um, our funding comes from. Uh, we also, the Adobe foundation is, uh, a big sponsor. We just, um, just officially received notice last week that they'll be, um, that they'll be providing us with another $300,000, which is why we get to get another, another full-time person. But also that provides the seed funds as well for 12 new chapters. Um, we also run ActW. So ActW is, sorry, cat. Um, we also, uh, we use ActW first and foremost as a way to fulfill our mission. So providing that community and support for, uh, for women who are in technology, but also it acts as a fundraiser. So we have a career fair that's part of the, um, that's part of that and companies pay to have a booth there and an ActW conference for a chapter will actually pay for the high school program every year if they run it. Uh, and so it's the the most perfect kind of fundraiser that would happen, you know, and be amazing even if it didn't raise funds. Uh, so that's that's a big part of it. When somebody is interested in starting a chapter, we um, we provide them with uh, a lot of materials, a lot of samples and examples, and we provide them with that community. So we have a monthly chapter lead call where every chat that every chapter is required to participate in and we talk about challenges we talk about successes and we allow everyone to um to share their uh, issues we do a leadership summit every year so headquarters flies one person per chapter into portland and we do a two and a half day event where the goal is to exchange information, but really it's all about creating that community between the chapters so that they can help each other out. And rather than just being an isolated pocket of activity, they know that they're part of this nationwide and soon to be international community pulling together. Uh, and I think that that's, that's, it's really inspiring to me. And I think it's inspiring to the chapters, uh, knowing they're not alone and knowing they have people that they can, they can ask questions of and, and, um, be a part of something together. Uh, so if somebody wants to start a chapter, we ask that they contact us. Um, they can just email at info at chicktech.org. And then, uh, we provide them with some information to show them because it's a, it's a big commitment as, as Nicole, I'm sure can tell you, um, we're building a community from the ground up and we partner with all these other organizations. We partner with Girl Develop It and Women Who Code and we're working on um, relationships with other organizations, um, Let's Means Who Tech. Uh, so we're able to pull those 
together and create our volunteer base to run the high school program. Um, but just the high school program itself requires a hundred to 150 volunteers per city. And yeah. I think that's great, you know, because we're, we're, that's, what's going to create the community is providing all those opportunities for everyone to work together. And that's, you know, as they're volunteering, they're creating their own community as well. Yeah, absolutely. I was just going to ask, and it sounds like this is a potential here that I could start a chapter maybe in conjunction with our local makerspace, or would it have to be separate? Yeah, it could definitely be a part. Okay, good. Nice short answer. I've got a lot of other questions I want to get to before I turn it back to Randall and before you have to leave. Um, uh, so that's, oh, here's a dilemma I have. Um so a lot of other people have started organizations like this. And what I hear from a lot of them is that they want to create a safe space for girls or women um, where they can do things on their own or, or do things just as women uh, without having a lot of extraneous influences, you know, from, I guess, having guys around. I don't know. But but I kind of that rubs me the wrong way because I think that we should be inclusive more. Um, so I'm I'm kind of wondering what your take on that is, and this is for mm-hmm. either of you. Maybe start with Janice because right. uh, I know you have to leave soon. But you know, what's your take on that? I mean, I, I always feel like no, let's try to be, let's try to find a way to get more women in, but have them be a part because then that makes the conversations, at least for me, it makes the conversations more valuable, more well-rounded. Um, there's ideas that I would have never thought of and that kind of thing. So what's your take on that? Create a safe space or and try to include everybody or or both maybe? Yeah. So one of the things that we do is, um, so we, uh, we are, our girl focused programs are for all, for girls who identify uh, or for people who identify as girls, right? So it can be trans, gender, people, whatever. Um, but our volunteers can be people of all genders. So it's not only women. Um, and on the uh, the career-focused side, we allow people of all genders with a focus on those who identify as women. Uh, so in your case, um, I mean, it, it's hard, right? Because there's, there's definitely pros to both sides. So I know from personal experience, um, like I, I, I believe the ideal is having that inclusive space where everyone is welcome. And I know that when I go somewhere that is male dominated, which is most maker spaces, I feel uncomfortable and I feel, I don't know if you've heard of stereotype threat. Um, but stereotype threat is basically where there's a stereotype and you expect other people to have it. Um, because most people do or whatever it might be. So in this case, if I go into um, like a wood shop, I know people are going to look at me and they're going to say, wow, she probably doesn't really know what she's doing. She's probably just a beginner. I need to like mansplain a lot of stuff to her. And, um, you know, regardless of how good my woodworking skills are, right? Um, And so that makes me feel uncomfortable knowing that I'm going to have awkward situations with almost everyone that I talk to where they're going to assume that I don't know nearly as much as they do. Uh, And so that's where I think a lot of it comes in is um, the expectation that it's going to be uncomfortable because it often, it often is. Um, And so I would say that if you want to have that inclusive space, you need to have discussions on that rather than just assuming like, oh, everyone wants to be inclusive, but have discussions on what unconscious bias looks like, what um, uh, what stereotype threat is, what imposter syndrome is, and really how even just the wording of anything can, you know, just, just one random sentence can make the, the difference between making it feel inclusive and making it feel exclusive or feel like you you don't belong. Um, and so I would say that the ideal, as I mentioned, is what you're talking about where everyone belongs and everyone feels welcome and everyone feels like they're valued for who they are. Um, and the reason that those safe spaces are important is because we're not there yet. And often I feel that maker spaces, you know, they have, you know, codes of conduct or they have those inclusivity statements, but they're not actively working to help their members control the unconscious bias that they have or the assumptions that they're making. Um, And so I think that that could go a long ways 
Um, and it's hard because, right, you're, you're membership based, right? So your members are usually paying to be there. And so to tell them, oh, now you have to go through mandatory training or we're going to have these mandatory discussions because we want to make this inclusive um, is could be a hard sell, especially for the people who need that the most. Yeah, that's uh, exactly right. Yeah, we, I mean, we, we do have that in our membership agreement and we do try to encourage that whenever possible. But it, but you're right, it, it's tough. I don't think it, it, would, it would be it would be an impediment, I think, if we if we try if we tried to force the training on everybody. I think the the best thing we can do is lead by example, at least for our makerspace, um, and the the board tries to do that. I've got one more question for you, real quick, because um, I know Randall wants to jump back in, and we're running short on time. But before you really have to leave to catch your flight, <laughs> what are the helmets behind you? They look like maybe Daft Punk helmets. Those are uh, <laughs> actually motorcycle helmets. So this oh. is mine, and that is my daughter's. Uh, oh, nice. <laughs> we need like a motorcycle helmet shelf, but until then they get to hang out in the family room. Um, yeah. So in May, I uh, randomly decided to get my motorcycle endorsement and my daughter is nine and she was really excited about this. And uh, she was like, oh yeah, we can go riding right away. I'm like, no, because we'll die. So after a few months <laughs> of me practicing, now we go on little, little rides together. So awesome. Yeah. Well, now I can. Now I can relate because I do have an Oregon motorcycle endorsement from the very day I got my driver's license. I had a motorcycle endorsement. So, yes, nice. I, I can definitely relate. I had a little Honda 185 as my first vehicle for two years. A, a, a tiny nice. bike. You could, you could like pick it up yeah. with one hand almost. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so that, totally unrelated. And I have a lot of other things to still ask <laughs> about this topic. Um, I'm looking at this from uh, not just, you know, trying to – you know, interact with women that 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 might not see tech as a career or or, or have been um, maybe a, 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 you know bullied or oppressed or something, and trying to choose that. Um, what can you say to guys? Um, and I think, including me, because I don't always know what I don't know, that would help more to bring more women. Uh, into STEM and also into the workplace in in technology, is, is, are there some key points that that we can start understanding better uh, to try to prevent the kinds of things you're talking about? I know you've sort of addressed this a little bit in your previous answer, but it, 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 do you have even the notion maybe of having guy workshops uh, without sounding too crazy here. Uh, is that, is that, a, is that occurring as a, as a possibility? Yeah. So, um, the, the biggest thing that I would say to guys is that stop believing that it's not a problem. So they did a study, I think back in March or it came out in March where they said that 68% of men in technology don't believe there's a gender issue. And that's a huge problem, right? Because every other study shows that there's an issue. And every time you talk to, or almost every time you talk to women, they have some sort of like pretty shitty story that they can tell you, right? Um, and we're losing, what what is it, 54, 56% of women in technology before year 10, which is double the rate of men uh, leaving technology. So there's, there's very, like the statistics show, if you only want to look at facts, the statistics show that this is a problem. Yet we have all these people who continuously disagree. Um, and instead of telling women that they're wrong, and instead of telling women that there's not a problem and they just need to like man up or something, um, start reading and start educating yourself. Because whenever you tell a woman that their experiences are not valid, that brings them one step closer to not wanting to be in technology. And that's unacceptable. You know, and you can you can decide that you don't have bias and you're going to be wrong every time because we all live in the same society and it has been proven that we all have biases. And so in order to help fix this problem, you need to start believing that there's a problem. And I would add yeah. that we want the women to take those uh, unconscious biasy trainings as well, not just the men, because when the women take it, they're quite surprised to find out that they have some of the same biases um, that we're, we're trying to fight. Um, it's just part of our culture. And if you take those tests and then you understand how you're thinking and how others are thinking, you can address it better instead of just 
making assumptions or just reading the statistics. I mean, learn more about yourself. And uh, I was just, uh, my brother's a uh, music educator, been doing this for uh, a couple decades as well, actually almost as long as I've been in the, in the well, actually slightly less because he had to go to school for this. But um, we had a conversation just the other day about um, what it's like in classrooms. And he says that uh, one of the differences between when he was in high school and, and when I was in high school and now is that it's all about teaching to the test um, uh, because teachers are now evaluated mostly on uh, making sure that you can recite the facts and all that. It sounds like it would be an ever increasingly more hostile environment for people to encourage to encourage people to follow their dreams and want to make a difference and want to build the resources and skill sets to want to make a difference. Do you have anything that we can start applying in schools that would kind of begin to offset that bias? Is this part of what Chick Tech is trying to do? So we haven't really started. Hard question. <laughs> either, either way. Oh, either way. answer. Go for it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thanks, Nicole. Uh, <laughs> um, so we haven't started doing anything on that yet. So working working with schools. That's definitely that's definitely something that we would like to do in the future. Um, and you know, even just being able to run unconscious bias trainings for teachers and helping them to understand those. And I, I think that I think that the the teaching to the test thing is is definitely an issue, uh, especially where we're looking at um, helping kids to try out different careers. There's no there's no test for trying out careers, right? Or or trying out new things. Um, and I, I think that it definitely um, uh, ties their hands a lot in terms of being able to to help them succeed. Uh, or to help to help the kids succeed, um, and I, I actually have a 16 year old son, so I definitely I see that a lot where he's not getting the um, he's not getting the exposure to careers, and he's not getting um, getting to really explore his interests because he's doing you know he's having to do very specific things that are just required by the the test requirements. Um, I don't I think that in order to fix that problem we would have to pull down the entire system and uh, remake it. So uh, we're not there yet. Maybe next year. Maybe next year we can do that. <laughs> Maybe next year. I like that. That's eternal optimism. Wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. And, and, I, I can uh, say and, uh, that some of this... Oh. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Some of the schools in, in Austin at least have invited us in to do, you know, uh, after school programs and, and try and, and help out in that way. But uh, yeah, that the reason I thought it was a hard question was exactly how Janice ended there. Um, you know, without being able to rework it all, I, I don't know how we could change it. But, um, you know, whenever we're invited in, we're we always uh, making every effort we can to, to go in there and, and do the programs for the girls or for the teachers um, to try and just raise awareness and, and hopefully encourage folks to be more creative. Well, okay. I'll just let myself be one more guinea pig and see if I still dig myself into a hole here. But, um, okay. So one of the things I used to think until hopefully five minutes ago is that <laughs> it was more about making sure that for uh, technology things, you were promoting more of the soft skills like uh, graphic arts and things like that, but I'm beginning to hear that that's probably even wrong thinking. Can you explain why if that's wrong thinking if it actually is and what I should be replacing that with? Oh, you want me to do it? I was, I was hoping yeah, Nicole would jump in this time. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Um, so Nicole will jump in. Um, I... <laughs> It's definitely about more than than just um, you know teaching the soft skills. Um, in um, it's about it's it's about giving everyone every possible opportunity. Um, you know, and um, showing them the various different ways they can they can be a part of this workforce and be comfortable in this workforce and uh, be inclusive in this workforce. And so you know when we're we're teaching these 
yes, we teach these girls specific skills in these workshops. But the point is to, by setting them up with these mentors um, of both genders, um, we're setting them up to see, you know, what it's like out there and to see that people are out there on their side. Um, and there are people that understand the problems they're facing and they want to, you know, help them with it. Um, you know, we do that through, yeah, we have fun and we show them the, you know, the, the skills they need, but there's more to it, um, throughout the whole year long program. Okay. That's, that's great. That, that helps me understand. Uh, we're almost out of time, uh, especially since Janice has a hard deadline here. Uh, one final question for both of you. Um, and it would be, we've covered a lot of the areas here, but is there anything that we really left out that you really want to make sure our audience is aware of before we let you go? Janice, we'll start with you. Um, not that I can think of. Uh, I mean, I just reiterate that every person um, in technology or near technology has the ability to either promote or not promote um, diversity in technology and b making an inclusive environment. And so um, by not controlling, by not doing anything, you're actually not promoting diversity. And uh, that sounds, mm -hmm. you're, you're actively not promoting diversity because you're not controlling for your unconscious biases. And those unconscious biases are 100% affecting the people around you. And so um, that's that's my biggest point that I'd like to end with is, please start looking into this and please start thinking about how your actions are affecting others around you, whether you're a man or a woman, um, as, as Nicole said, um, because if we can start, if we can start making sure that everyone is educated on that and really understanding their, um, their thought processes, that's going to go a really long way. Um, and then of course, everyone should definitely start Chick Tech chapters wherever they're at obviously. Awesome. Awesome. And uh, Nicole, same question. <laughs> you took what I was going to say. I figured <laughs> you weren't talking anything about, you know, starting a chapter. So I would focus on that one. Um, <laughs> look at the list of chapters on the, the Chick Tech site and um, help out because like Janice said, um, it is a lot of work. Um, and I just, I just gave a talk at all things open about what it takes to, to start a chapter. And um, I, I did talk about, you know, having no life for the first few months and just sitting in front of my computer and telling everyone about us. Um, so either volunteer if you have a chapter in your area or, or reach out to us and uh, talk about how we can get a chapter started in your area. But it's rewarding, yeah. right, Nicole? It is so rewarding. I, <laughs> I not only in helping the girls, um, but in um, making connections with other women uh, in the industry who are just unbelievable. So I have an amazing group here in Austin, and I, I love it. I wouldn't change it for anything. I'm exhausted, <laughs> but I wouldn't change it. <laughs> well, Nicole and Janice, I'm sorry, we're out of time. I'm, I'm glad to have had you both on the show today talking about this very important topic, and I'm sure more people will be looking at it. We'll have uh, URLs in our show notes, uh, but the basic URL that we have is chicktech.org, and uh, you can go there and find all these other things, including the list of locations, which – Strangely enough, does not have anything in Southern California right now. So we're working we're on LA, to... though. LA. LA. All right. All right. Yes. LA. My, my third home away. My third home away from home is LA and the new Silicon uh, Beach, as they call it there, the Santa Monica area. So awesome. Awesome. Okay, guys. Thanks a lot for uh, coming on the show and talking to us about Chick Tech. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. That was. Uh, that was Nicole Engard and uh, Janice. Let me mangle it one more time. Levin Hagen uh, Seeley, or maybe Levin Hagen. Levin, 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 one of those. All right. Anyway, <laughs> what, what do you think, Aaron? Sorry. Well, I mean, <clears throat> like I said, I mean, this is something that's near and dear to my heart as someone who, uh, A, just believes in this um, and uh, works in the industry and and can see. I mean, even, even when, uh, uh, when I took my son to Cornell, uh, he's interested in going there for college and uh, he's interested in computer science. And so I just happened to throw out while we were on the tour, hey, what's, uh, you know, how, what's your uh, male female ratio in engineering? And they said, oh, it's great, it's great, it's great. Uh, this, you know, we've, we've got this percentage and this percentage, but except for computer science, where we only have, I forget what the number was, like 5% uh, female. Um, 
in, in computer science. So it was kind of like, oh, you know, was, I was excited for a while and then it was like, oh, but um, mm. I think this is just super important. Um, and so really glad to hear what they have to say. It's given me some ideas to take back to my makerspace to try to, to try out. And uh, I don't know. I think we may try to open a chapter. There is a San Francisco chapter already, but I think they may be in the city. I'm going to have to go check it out. Um, so maybe we can start a chapter here locally because what I see looking at our high school uh, here is that if you look at the AP computer science course, um, I think there may be one or two girls in that class. Um, and we need to get that number up because, like I said, the benefits are huge, not just for the girls themselves, obviously, as being another career choice or something that they may love to do in their lives. But having – I found over the years having women involved in a conversation, it's a, sometimes it can be a different perspective and a very, very valuable perspective uh, to have. Just diff, people with different backgrounds come up with different ideas, whether it's girls, women, people from other cultures, whatever. You want to have the most inclusive group possible discussing a topic because you're going to get a lot more ideas that way. And whatever your goal you're working towards is going to be benefited by having those opinions present. Absolutely. One of the, my privileges is that I've been, again, like all over the world, and I have friends all over the world. Hello, y'all. Friends all over the world who, uh, who, who have given me a lot of different ways of looking at things, and I've been very appreciative of that. Uh, one of the takeaways I've got from this conversation um, is that uh, probably right up until the beginning of this show, I was sort of thinking that what we were going to talk about is more hands-on stuff, maker stuff. So like when you were at the beginning of the show talking about, well, they get to actually play with robots and things like that, and that's going to attract more women. But, you know, what Nicole said in the early part of the show, which was, you know, we want to make a difference, and we don't see how being programmers can make a difference. Um, and, and I could really see that as a bias. It, I, I'm sometimes surprised why 80% of the workforce actually goes to work every day knowing that we typically don't make a difference. I'm mean, going to keep saying it that way because that's the way it is. Um, but, you know, but th there are opportunities, especially in open source now, to, to really sort of have impacts on society, on things that are important to all of us. Um, and we've done a number of the shows here that have been about that, about uh, – you know, being found in a in a in a, in a crisis or uh, uh, having microfinance banking, things like that, that are just very important to having the world be a better place. And I think through some of those projects, if they were a lot more um, a lot more uh, made popular, uh, we might have um, a change there as well. And well, I'm doing my part by having this show um, and hopefully talking to a wide variety of inputs like that. Uh, anything else, Aaron, before we uh, help close out the show here? Uh, no, but I do want to encourage people to go get involved and check out and see if they have a local chapter uh, because it is important. And especially if you're working on any sort of organization or building a company or, uh, you know, it's just it, it really is incredibly important um, for, for everybody. So go check it out. Great, great. And so our upcoming guest list has not gotten any longer since uh, the last show. By the way, uh, uh, we took a gap last week. I was happy on a cruise ship uh, in uh, temperatures that were about 20 degrees warmer than they were in San Diego where I left, which was really, really nice. Um, uh, I got a lot of work done. I got a lot of uh, um, uh, diet sodas uh, consumed. I bought a package and I think I made them lose money on their package. So that was really nice. Unlimited soft drinks for the, for a geek. Um, what can you say? Anyway, so, uh, coming up, uh, next week we do have MetaBrains, which is, uh, you might be more familiar with one of their first projects, which was music brains, at least the way I understand them. And that's basically a uh, community, sourced uh, data uh, running on community sourced software. So that'll be the open source uh, data and software elements, which is always kind of interesting. Oh, my ZSH, which are tools for managing your ZSH config. I am a big ZSH user. Uh, once I discovered that a actual shell that wasn't the C shell could run something when I SSH to someplace and ZSH was my choice uh, from then on, so I could run the ZSHRC when I SSH somewhere, which uh, no other shell seems to be able to do. Maybe Bash does, I don't know. Uh, but I don't consider Bash a reasonable shell. Now I'm going to get hate mail. Uh, the following week is uh, Zalando, which is about uh, 
uh, a fashion platform that has 19 million users, and they've open sourced some of their sub projects. So they want to bring more people in to help with that sort of stuff. That's also my birthday week, by the way. November 22nd is my upcoming birthday. So if you're uh, curious, I think I have an Amazon wish list if you want to buy me stuff. No, just kidding. Just kidding. Not using this show as a platform to make more goodies. Uh, GPRC following that immediately, which would be the uh, Google's remote procedure call interface, which do things like uh, service detection, high availability, a bunch of other stuff, uh, automatically running protocol buffers over it if you choose, things like that, looking like that. We do have a couple of shows on the short list. Uh, Twine, we're still trying to get that finally scheduled, and Karina, um, uh, which is an easy to use instant on native container environment. Both of those had been previously scheduled. We're looking to reschedule those. I'm talking with a bunch of new people. Uh, hopefully by the end of this week, I'll have uh, three or four more shows scheduled and possibly even open up Q1. You can find my progress all the time at twitter.tv slash floss, which is the homepage for this show. Linked from there is our upcoming guest list. Um, uh, we also get a lot of uh, uh, questions from our chat room, which you can find out about also by going to that page. We have a live stream. It's uh, We tape at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time on Tuesdays. This is Pacific time U.S., so, of course, we have not changed to daylight savings time, unlike pretty much the rest of the northern hemisphere. Uh, so we're taping at our own independent uh, daylight savings time thing. Uh, God, I wish we could just get rid of DST. It would be so much easier. Anyway, we're normally on Tuesdays, and that today is Tuesday for me. Um, follow us at Floss Weekly on Google Plus and on at Floss Weekly on Twitter. I did just the last couple of days get the link from Google Plus to Twitter working again. It was going to go away uh, yesterday. I fixed it by then. Uh, follow me at Google Plus on Randall L. Schwartz there, and also that gets. Uh, Tweet it over to Merlin, M-E-R-L-Y. And I have nothing to plug anytime soon, not at any conference and stuff. We do start conference season uh, acquisitions sometime coming up in the next uh, few months for everything that happens next summer. And I'll start being able to tell you about that. Any uh, plugs you want to make uh, there, Aaron, for the uh, show? Yeah, sure. Real quick, you can follow me on Google Plus or or everything goes out from there. So Twitter, Facebook is fine too. Uh, I am still working on my book, Linux for Makers. So hopefully that'll be out soon. Um, and I will be in Germany. I think it's the week of November 13th. Uh, I'll be in Germany. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so if you want to uh, catch up with me, I'll be at NetApp Insight Conference in Berlin. If you're in Berlin or if you're going to the conference, uh, if you're a NetApp customer, uh, come find me. I'll be in the booth uh, down on the show floor, so in the expo hall. So come – if you're a fan of the show and you're a NetApp, you know, you got to cross those paths somehow. But if that's you, yes. uh, come find me and say hello. I'd love to meet you. Great, great. And uh, we're up against a pretty hard deadline here. So we'll see you all again next week. Really, we will. Not faked like the last time. We'll see you all again next week on Floss Weekly. Floss Weekly.